We got some rails off from a fence by the side of the road, and the passengers would pry up the stage whilst the driver touched up the horses and getting out of his or this, and then we went a short distance further only to go through the operation again. And in this way, we managed to get along for some distance. In one place, we got into a drift and could not find any rail or anywhere to pry up the, the wheels. And so upon the side of the road, the fences were all gone as far as we could see. What to do in this extremity was the question. The driver, in a rage, was swearing at the, 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 the workers for burning up their fences. And whilst I was at work near where I supposed the fence should be, and kicking up the snow, and fortunately, I found a rail some distance under it. We now found rails along under the snow and managed to get through to use in this way those that we found, but they were rather scarce, and I should think for a distance of some eight miles we were at that work. We got some stage and uh, the stage out and proceeded on our way. But as it has continued to snow all the time, we did not go a great distance before we went into a snowbank that was more formidable than any that we had met before. I jumped off the stage and looking ahead, at the bank of snow, I could see as far as my sight extended, and I told the driver it was no use to go any further. He moved down, and after looking around, came to the same conclusion, and as we had stopped opposite a house, we unharnessed the horses, while one went and housed and aroused the in inmates of the house, and having come out of that house and thrown open the barn doors, we drove them into the barn. The people of the house built up a large fire in the kitchen, and the driver and passengers, excepting myself, went in and laid down by the fire and went to sleep and as for myself i took charge of the horses wiping off the snow and rubbing them down which took me until the end of the morning i was extremely tired when i finished my job but as soon it was light I went to the neighbors and got them out shoveling the snow, and then returned to the house. The driver said to me very well for my services that I would be given a fare of some two dollars and a half in monies, besides buying a number of my baskets that he did and presenting them to the inmates of the house where we stopped. We got our breakfast and then started, making but slow progress, but got as far as Dixmond, where they changed the horses and then kept on to Troy, arriving there about noon. As this was as far as, we could, as I could go on the stage, and as they were going in a different direction, I got my dinner at the tavern and started to work uh, toward Unity, about six miles distant. This was about the hardest jaunt I have ever experienced, 
as I had upon my back some seventy or eighty pounds weight, and the snow was drifting badly, and not even a footprint was visible for some considerable part of the way. But plucking up courage, I started off to travel it. For some little distance I got along pretty well, but then I came to quite a drift which was pretty deep, and to go through I thought that I must unsling my baskets and then throwing them a little distance ahead of me, I, I waded up to them and throwing them again, I pushed along them to them and in, in this way I worked along until I passed a drift and then resuming my load kept on until I came to another. At times my strength would be exhausted and I would lie down upon my back upon the snow to recover my health uh, and my breath and this way I kept on until worn out and completely exhausted. I reached Unity, having traveled some six miles, taking all the afternoon. And after getting something to eat, uh, I sat and went to bed and slept soundly that morning, and, and then walked towards freedom selling my baskets upon the way, and having sold out, I walked to Bangor and took the cars for Old Town. I stopped a few days and to selling out my baskets, and uh, then loading up again, I took the stage for Waterville and then walked to Kendall's Mills. Newport and then Palmyra, part of the distance by stage. <laughs> but a storm came up as I was traveling and my baskets got wet and one color ran into another so that they were a rather streaked lot and not being able to sell them I exchanged for tobacco, candy, and other things to put into my shop, and then went back to Old Town. This was my last excursion in peddling baskets while, the, while here, and I found it a hard life, and all the pers although a person might be very tough, Yet this kind of life, followed up pretty closely, would wear upon me, and soon after I arrived back, I went to Greenfield after some fish or, and then some baskets as well, and after a game as well, and had it carried to Old Town whilst I walked back. The, uh, I was gone about a week, and I got I had got one deer and a load of basket ash, which I hauled to the road and had it carried to Old Town by conveyance whilst I walked back. I was out on a hunting excursion soon after this in the same place with some company when I got strayed away from them, having with me a basket, a hatchet, and some provisions, I was unsuccessful in shooting any game, and on the third day I got entirely out of provisions. It came up dark and foggy, and to complete my misery, it began to rain and having no camp, I got completely wet through powder and caps, matches, and myself completely drenched in water. 
I was in my, what might be called a well-termed a fix. Night was approaching, surrounded on all sides by a dense wood, without any compass, dog, or companion relying alone upon good luck to bring me out of the dilemma, and to spend much of the time in forming plans would have been useless and perhaps fatal. Therefore, taking a direction, I pursued my way, walking swiftly through the forest. I kept on for about a short distance through the woods, when all at once I stopped and found a logging road, which I could hardly see. It was so dark, and walking along in this road a few rods, I was cheered by a light in the distances which I found to proceed from a log cabin. I went up and rapped upon the door when a Frenchman came and invited me in and kindly procured me a change of clothing and stirring up the log fire requested me to be seated. I found upon inquiry that I was not a great distance from home, and after partaking of a warm supper, I went to bed. It cleared off very cold in the night, and when I arose in the morning, the water in the road was frozen solid. But after eating breakfast, I thanked my host and started for home where I arrived to the satisfaction of my friends who were somewhat fearful that I might have perished in the woods. The, the, this was the most successful hunt that I had ever experienced, but the one that followed was not quite so fortunate as this one was, as my story will show. I started off one day a short time after my last excursion upon another hunting expedition alone, but was more fortunate in finding game, for I shot some deer upon the third day. I got strayed away while shooting the deer, and having no compass, and be it being overcast, I found that I was lost. I had some matches and a hatchet, and I built a camp for myself, and having dug away the snow, prepared to build a fire. I got some birch bark and kindled me a fire and soon began to feel quite comfortable. But not having wood enough to last me all night, I went to cut up some more, when in sinking into a pine knot, my hatchet glanced, and one corner entered the top of my foot. I had on, besides my moccasins, three pair of stockings, which protected my foot somewhat, but not enough to prevent my getting a severe cut. This was something that I had not reckoned upon and I was without anything to bind up the wound, but I knew that I must stop the flow of blood, which had even a short space of time made me feel faint. I put on my snowshoes and made my way up to a swamp or where I got a stick of osier wood and scraping off the bark, I chewed it up soft and applied it to the wound, binding it up with a part of the sleeve of my shirt that I tore off. But finding that this would not do, the gash was open. I took off the bandage, and taking a pin, I brought the edges of the wound together and stuck it through and winding some thread underneath the ends of the pin, I brought the wound closely together, and then applying my bark, 
I bound it up with a piece of my shirt. I then limped to where my fire was and renewed it and gathering my blanket around me laid upon some boughs near the fire. I passed the night pretty comfortably considering my condition and in the morning made preparations to find my way home. I found that every step I took caused my wound to bleed, but as the only alternative for me was to find my way out, I continued on and fortunately came across a road that left me safely out. Not seeing anyone upon the road, I took a shorter cut across some woods, leaving my mark as I went along, and at last arriving at Old Town, and proceeded to my shop. When opening the door, I felt weak and fell prostrate on the floor. My partner came and took me up and carried me into the back part of the shop where he lived himself and laid me upon the bed where I shortly recovered. My wound was attended to and telling my partner that I had left two deer, he and his brother started after them, tracking my way back to the spot of the blood by which they felt that they found upon the snow. They got the deer to the road and hired a man to take them to Old Town. I was laid up by this accident about two months, and as I had lost some considerable blood, I was extremely weak. When sufficiently recovered to go out, I went to a school which was next to the building of our shop. This was a most wretched place for a school, for when it rained, the water came through the roof and when it snowed, it would drift in some part of the room. As the building was so open, of course it was cold and uncomfortable. And in this place, the Indian children gathered themselves to be instructed. I would say a few words here in regard to the subject of education amongst the Indians at Old Town as it existed at that time there. And I am not aware as yet that there has been any change for the better. The same old building, the same old rickety stairs and leaky roof are there now. And as long as we suppose, as the materials hold together, they intend to occupy the time-honored building for the education of Indian children. The building is best described in the language of, of our tribe uh, and the representative of the Penobscot tribe who said before the legislature that the building weeped without and within and looked ragged and tattered like a dead poplar in the woods. The interests of the Indian children were presented by their representative before the legislature and the need of appropriating was rejected. I went to school a short time and after recovering somewhat from my lameness, having quite a number of baskets, I went to Bangor and took my baskets with me to Boston. I intended to retail them out, but finding that I could not travel very well, I sold them out in lots and then went back to Old Town and stopped a short time. Whilst there, I became acquainted with Susan Newell, whom I afterwards married, and her brothers Thomas and Loring Newell. 
The brothers wished me to go with them to Salem, Massachusetts and stop until fall making baskets and then they wished me to travel with them through the winter and give entertainments. I was somewhat tired of Old Town and also dissatisfied with my partner in the shop and we therefore separated and I went with the Newells to Bangor and there took the boat for Boston, Massachusetts and then went to Salem where we found some Indians with whom we camped. After arriving there, I was set to work pounding ash for baskets and also brought bas ac ashes upon my shoulder from the surrounding swamps to our camp for the making of those baskets. Before the ash can be worked, or before it will be stripped, it had to be pounded very hard, striking about two blows in the same place until every part has been pounded, and then each year's growth becomes somewhat separated and can be stripped off, and these parts can be stripped if desired into pieces as thin as ribbon. The strips are usually about seven feet long and smoothed by placing the strip upon the knee and then gauging the knife upon it, drawing the strip through, giving it an equal thickness, which requires some little practice. Whilst we here were there, we used to shoot at money some four or five rods distant, and by this we picked up considerable change. While shooting one day, an Irishman standing near to raise a laugh knocked my cap down over my eyes. This he continued to do for some time until I was exceedingly angry and raising my bow I struck him pretty hard over the head and started to run, the Irishman after me with a large stone which he threw, but it did not strike me. I then turned upon him and in running round the tent he fell and I was just in the act of striking him when a companion of his struck me in the neck with a slingshot the marks of which I blow, I, that, that, that blow I shall probably carry to my grave. Fortunately for myself, I did not receive the full force of the blow, as it grazed my neck, but what I did receive was enough to make me stagger into the tent which was open and prostrated me. I was somewhat stunned but soon recovered and went out of the tent and around to where the Irishmen were when I heard that the one that struck me swearing that he would serve me and every redskin in the same manner, but he no sooner got the words out of his mouth when before he was aware of it by a well-directed blow under the chin I laid him prostrate and then seizing an axe that was near, I told them to keep at a proper distance, and the police came coming up at that same time took the fellows away. Uh, they vowed vengeance against us and threatened to destroy our tent, and for a few nights we watched pretty closely, expecting trouble but no one came to molest us. We remained in this place about a week, being troubled exceedingly by the Irish, who came to our camping ground intoxicated, and then insulted us in many different ways. We next went to Manchester 
and while waiting at the depot to take the cars for that place, a gentleman came up and commenced a conversation with me, asking various questions and at length asked me if I should not like to learn a trade, and that if I did, he would give me a good chance. There had quite a number of those gathered around us, and the Newells, fearing that I might want to go with him, began to talk with the rest of the company in the Indian tongue, and also told me that the whites were a miserable people, and persuaded me to run and get on to the team that had our baggage, then that we hired to haul to Manchester. I believed all the Indians, and that they told me about the whites, and I thought they were a very bad people, and I therefore hurried off and soon caught up with the team and jumped on. <coughs> when we arrived at Manchester, we found that our friends that went in the cars had secured a place near a salt marsh for us to put up our tents, and we therefore drove immediately to the spot and put them up. We made a great many bows and arrows while there, and also some baskets, and also picked up some change at shooting of money. At the depot, where we usually shot at money, was a long platform, and one day, while shooting there, a man stuck a beautiful knife into the platform, saying that he would give it to me if I would strike it with my arrow. He had placed the edge towards me, and when I fired, I noticed that a splinter flew from the arrow, and as I ran up and took the knife, and put it into my pocket, the man came up and said that I did not touch the knife with my arrow, but picking up the splinter, I convinced him to the contrary, and kept the knife. He intended to impose upon me by sticking up his knife toward me with the edge, so that in firing I might split my arrow and then walk up and take his knife and thus raise a laugh among the crowd that had gathered around. But he found that he was mistaken, for I got far ahead and took the knife, and we were one day shooting pieces of money stuck up in the cracks in a post while there was a drunken man come along and would go in the way of our shooting. We advised him to get out of the way, but he paid no attention to what we said, but was careless and unconcerned, saying that, let, that them little fellows couldn't hurt him if they did hit him. The ones that were shooting at this time were little boys, and as one of them, not five years old, let an arrow fly, the man reeled in its way, and it struck him in the forehead, knocking him senseless, and it was some time before they brought him to his senses. If the arrow had been a sharp pointed one, it would undoubtedly have killed him, but the head of arrows that they used when they shoot at money are about the size of a quarter. We remained here about a week, and then went to Essex, Massachusetts. Myself and one of the Newells ran the distance there, and going into the shipyard, made quite a little sum of money before our company arrived with their team. We camped near the shipyard, and remained there about four weeks, making baskets and such, and I worked very hard while there, hugging upon my shoulders the ash to make our baskets of, 
some six miles from the nearby swamp. I used to pound it in the wood and also strip it there, and then tying up a bundle, put a strap around it and then around my forehead, and another over my shoulders, and in this way I carried the ash to the place where we would produce the baskets. From here we went to Ipswich, where we had a great amount of company coming not only in the day, but keeping it up late at night. But we did very well while there, selling a great many baskets. We next went to Amesbury, and while there, we obtained permission to cut some ash in a swamp a short distance from our camps. The swamp was a very large one, and we cut over the line upon another man, his, his property, which we had to settle for a short time then after we, or before we left the place. We experienced a very severe storm while there, and the wind blowing down our tents, whilst the rain completely drenched us, which was rather bad, as we had a sick child at the time with us. A short time after, the child died, and I carried the body to Haverhill, where it was buried in the burying ground, and having my horse, I secured a large express team and drivers, and went back to Amesbury to move our goods to Haverhill. There, having packed up our things, we started off, and about eleven o'clock that night, as we were going down a short hill not far from Haverhill, the hold back on the wagon broke, and the horse in the shafts, for we had a tandem team, began to kick, and the driver jumped off, leaving the horses in full possession of the team, and I was seated on the top of the load at the back of the wagon, which was not a very desirable position, considering the lay of the land before me. Upon each side of the road was a rail fence, and the ground fell off on both sides from eight to ten feet. The horses, finding no restraint was upon them, bounded down the hill, striking the rail fence at the side of the road and smashing it down. The carriage, horses, and myself were precipitated down the embankment, but I jumped before I reached the ground, clearing myself somewhat from the boxes, trunks, and other things that were stored upon the wagon, and escaped with some slight bruises. After recovering from the fall, I found that the horses had been bruised some, but the carriage was a complete wreck, and our goods were scattered promiscuously over the ground. One of our number went ahead and procuring a lantern, came back and we picked up the things and putting them in a pile, covered them over. The driver procured a light wagon and took the two Indians that were with us and went to Haverhill, leaving me to take charge of the goods. I fixed up a suitable place and laid down and was awakened in the morning by some of the neighbors who had brought me a capital breakfast, to which I did ample justice. After eating my breakfast, our driver came with a good team and loading up our goods, went to Haverhill and camping after we arrived near the church there. <coughs> I was married while there to Susan Newell by the priest that who abided there, who when about to marry me asked me what my name was. I told him that I was called John Loisian, and sometimes John Glossian. He then wanted to know if I had been christened. 
I told him that I could not tell him positively whether I had or not. So the priest told me that I could not marry unless I knew that I had been christened. I again told him that I did not know, but that he was intending to marry if so, he must do it quickly, and I did not wish to stand there to be stared at, as there would be a, quite a number of those that had gathered around us, thinking more probably of his fee than of his objections, as that would be more than to balance any compunctions of his conscience, if he had any, he married us. I became acquainted while there with Elder Thomas Sunrise, a Protestant belonging to the Seneca tribe in New York, who came to Haverhill to preach. He was a very smart speaker and an intelligent man and I became very much interested in him. He wanted me to travel with him, and I promised to meet him in Lawrence a short time before I was married. So I started upon the railroad to meet him there, but after going some four miles, I altered my mind and turned and went back to the camp. I worked very hard whilst camping at that place, bringing ash for baskets from a neighboring swamp to the camp where we manufactured them and then taking them upon my shoulders to carry around to the villages to sell. We next took the cars for Salmon Falls, New Hampshire, where we stopped about one month making and selling baskets. We also gave an entertainment in that place and did very well. We next went to Great Falls and camped upon the east bank of the river in a thick grove of pines. The first night we arrived there, we were out of provisions and one of our company went down to the Union store and procured some pork and crackers, and we prepared to have something to eat. But upon examination, our pork proved to be bad, and the crackers had been kept so long that they were wormy. We were very indignant at this piece of imposition, and at the same night, I took the basket and carried the provisions back and entering the door, I asked the keeper if that was the kind of pork and crackers that he sold people to eat. He replied that it was good enough for any redskin. I told him that it did not suit us and that he might take it back and pay me the money or exchange for good provisions. He, he seemed very independent about it at first and said that I had better leave. But finding that he could not get rid of me so easily, he exchanged for the goods and gave me better provisions. A short time after in the same store, I was insulted by the same man. I went to purchase some sugar and after having but a few cents in change, I asked for only half a pound, and he replied that he did not sell sugar in such quantities. I was angry and replied that he could sell bad pork and wormy crackers, which made him afterwards keep very quiet, as he did not wish the fact circulated around the place of his ill sales. There are many who deceive the Indians in this manner as they travel from place to place, thinking that as they are poor and somewhat degraded, they deserve no better treatment. But they also suppose that the Indians have no pride 
nor principle, and therefore a certain class of people take particular pains to impose upon them by selling or giving to them only what at other times they would throw away. But the Indians to the contrary, I care not how reduced they may be, have some pride left and they are particularly sensitive. No slight affront can be given them without their notice and no kind act without its being remembered. It is also, I am well aware, a notorious fact that the Indians at present time have not that stability of character, those principles of honor for which they were originally noted, and some good reasons can be given how this change has been effected. They have been driven from their hunting grounds, and before the onward march of civilization have been driven deeper into the forests. They have been cheated in their trades with the whites, and more than this, as they are a passionate people, having strong temperaments and being fond of stimulants, the strong water of the whites has proved destructive to their better natures. The fire water has brought the Indians down. Until now, at the present day, they are far from having those original virtues and firm principles of honor that characterize their fathers and are only a wreck of their former state. The Indian once, like the mighty oak, defied his enemies, braving all by his strength, but rolling years have caused the trunk to decay and the cold blasts have shorn him of his grandeur and strength, and now he today stands alone. Looking out upon the world, he sees the forest spread before, but looking beyond, the cities and towns rise up to meet his gaze, inhabited by a race of people unlike himself, having customs different from his tribe, and thinking of the past when his forefathers chased the deer or shot the bear, where he now finds the smoke rising from some village, beholding the iron road linking together towns and states, and the iron horse plunging fearlessly and defiantly along no wonder that he is silent and morose, that he is revengeful, and I might say deceitful. No wonder that he drowns his feelings in the fire water and tries to forget the memories of the past in that stimulating cup. As we think of this and of many of the sufferings of the poor Indian as he journeys along to his last great hunting ground, from which no pale face will drive him, and where game will be abundant, let us aid him as we can by words of cheer and tokens of kindness, knowing that the Maker of us all is in no respecter of persons found. We moved our camp back a short distance into the woods that we might be protected from the cold winds. My wife, being well acquainted with roots and herbs, having studied for the practice of medicine, I went to the village and left orders to have some circulars printed for her. A few days after, I went to get them. 
and I found that there were some bills posted up on the streets, which read precisely like that copy that I had left at the printing house, with the exception of my wife's name, for which the name of one of the men of our company was substituted. I went to the office and got my bills and found that a, that a some that some person at the office had liked my coffee with of the above exception and I was somewhat indignant and would not post up one of my bills in that place and I walked to Milton three ponds asking and taking some baskets with me which I sold on the way and I also distributed my bills when I was returning to Great Falls, there was a man that was going there, and, I, and offered, I offered him a quarter to carry me. But although he had no load, he refused. I told him that I would get there before him, and waiting until he had gone some distance ahead, I started upon a run, and soon caught up. And as I passed by, I, I bade him good day and kept on. I arrived at Great Falls before him, going the distance 14 miles in about one hour and three quarters. A few days later, I moved to Milton, where we built a tent, and I borrowed a stove which I placed in my camp, the funnel run, running out about four feet from the ground. Soon after we moved there, a number of persons came to see us. The gentlemen of the party, as, as the others were of, of ladies, <coughs> was ridiculing everything we had. He was a large man, and the lower part of his face was covered with a profusion of whiskers, so much so that where the mouth of the individual was could only be guessed at. But before he left our camp, by a fortunate circumstance, he was divested of a large proportion of his superfluous hair, leaving his mouth plainly visible. Among the many things that attracted his attention was our stove pipe, which ran out on the back side of our camp, and calling to his companions, his lady companions, he said, Come, ladies, here's where they take the pictures. And so they would gather together, and at the same time, he placed his face up to the stovepipe. My wife at the same time lifted the canvas to get some wood and also opened the stove door to put some in. And when a draft of air came through the opening and into the stove, sending a sheet of flame out of the stovepipe somewhat to the discomfiture of the gentleman who was having his picture taken. He drew back his face quickly, looking somewhat different than it did before. The whiskers were singed off closely, and he presented altogether a rather comical appearance. His mouth was visible, and in not a very good-natured manner, he cursed us somewhat extravagantly. Having observed the operation, I told him the next time before we shaved him, he had better come in and get some lather upon his face, that we then could perform the operation somewhat better. But as it was, we should not charge him anything for the operation. The ladies in his company could not help laughing, which only enraged him, and he left in no enviable mood, venting his spleen by pouring out curses and oaths upon us. I secured quite a, 
quantity of ash for baskets while there, and going some distance to a swamp where I cut the ash, carrying it upon my shoulders to the road. I found it very hard work to get the sticks of ash from the swamp, as some were seven or eight feet long, and weighing from 75 to 150 pounds, these I carried upon my shoulder from the swamp, wading through and the water to the roads where I had hauled it to the depot. And away by the cars, it was carried to Great Falls. We moved to Great Falls where we stopped all winter. One day I went off to sell baskets about four miles from the tent when I came across a beautiful puppy, which was the owner said I might have for a number of baskets, which I then agreed to make. A few days after having made the baskets, I went and got my puppy, which I carried in my arms to the camp. Although weighing only about 30 pounds, I found myself very tired when I arrived to the camp. My dog proved to be a faithful companion to me, as he was tractable and the best watchdog that I ever saw. As, as no person could take anything from the tent in my absence. One day, a short time after I got in, an Irishman was coming to the camp, somewhat intoxicated, and on his way, as it was towards night, he fell into a gravel pit where he lay rolling and splashing in the water. My dog, hearing the noise, jumped out of the camp and ran down to where he was, and seizing the poor fellow by his coat, he held him, and when I came to his assistance, the poor man, thinking that some person had got hold of his coat, was endeavoring to compromise with my dog by saying, Let me go, let me go, and I will give you a turkey for Thanksgiving. But my dog was not acquainted with the Irish language, uh, or not having much faith in compromises, did not need his promises and only replied by giving an extra pull, which sent the poor man sprawling again. I called the dog off, and lifting up the poor man, I started him toward his home, and from that day to this, my dog has not been on very friendly terms with Irishmen, but whenever he, s he hears one talk, he will growl and he seemed ever afterwards to own them a grudge. We built a hand sled, and the following winter we hauled in the wood that we burned upon it, breaking dry limbs from the trees in the neighboring wood. It was a very hard winter for us, as we suffered much from the scarcity of provisions, and also from the cold. The people in this place were very penurious, and one person who owned considerable woodland said that he had much rather the wood would rot upon the land than to be carried off by the lazy redskins, so he said, as he turned us. We therefore fared rather hard while there, suffering much for the necessities of life, to say nothing about the comforts or luxuries, I was not very well used, I thought, by the rest of the company, as I did the greater part of the labor, and the whole amount of ash that I procured, some 150 sticks, I used only two, while the rest of the company used the balance. I had paid the freight upon our baggage for some time past myself, and also the fares as we traveled in the cars, and I began to think that I was leading a rather hard life, and finding that my money was about gone, I concluded to leave the place. I started off after to leave, but I had not gone a 
great distance, but I thought better of my plan, and therefore I, therefore I turned about and went back to the camp. Whilst here, Big Frank, that I have before referred to, came along giving exhibitions with a traveling company. One evening, they gave an entertainment and they usually reserved the front seats for ladies, but on that evening, two drunken fellows had seated themselves there and were laughing and swearing and stamping their feet, making considerable noise and confusion. Big Frank was somewhat excited at their behavior and told them that they might go and get their money and leave or sit still. They paid no attention to him, but continued as noisy as ever when Big Frank sprang and seizing one in each hand, dragged them to the top of the stairs and threw them both down and then returned and continued the performance. The company, when they left, took some of our party with them, and but finding that their agent had cheated them, they would not let him get into the cars, but made him stop behind, and they went off. This agent that they left behind wanted to get up a show in the place, and he spoke to me. I had some money, and with it I purchased some dresses for myself and my wife, and the agent advertised that besides the Indians, he had engaged the services of a Professor Mooney, a celebrated sleight-of-hand performer. The evening came, and they had in front of the building a splendid flag, and upon it was to wave, to, to announce the, the proceedings, and Professor Mooney and the Indians would perform tonight, it was written out. I understood before the time came that the professor would not be there, yet I ende endeavored in all ways that I could to get up a good show. We had quite a large audience, but when they found out that Professor Mooney would not be there, they raised a breeze, as it were, quickly and rushing toward the stage, they demanded their money, and I and my wife started for the door, walking upon the seats, and after getting out of the building, we made our way with all possible dispatch to the camp. The agent and another white man who was instrumental with him in getting up the entertainment got a number of rowdies to protect them as they went to the tavern where they stopped. Otherwise, they would have been mobbed. The audience, being determined to make as much out of it as they could, stripped the large flag to pieces and thus ended the great Mooney and exhibition of the Indian. I lent the agents eight dollars to commence, which I lost, to say nothing about what I spent for dresses and other things, and by this operation I got into debt somewhat, and had to pawn some of my things to pay my bills, and leaving Great Falls with my wife and two Indians, we took the cars to Kennebunk, Maine, and from the depot we walked down to the village and tried to get a place to camp out, but we were not successful. We therefore kept on to Kennebunk Port, but not getting a place there, we walked back to the village where we pawned some of our things and procured something to eat, and then went back to the depot, and so then we sent our things by the cars and walked ourselves to Seiko, where we slept in the depot. 
The next morning, being rainy, we did not have agreeable weather to look to us for a place to camp, and not finding any place to suit us in Seiko, we camped in the wood opposite the Biddeford Depot. We obtained permission and pitched our tent, working until late in the evening to get comfortable quarters to sleep in. But when they were far from comfortable, so far as there was ice underneath the hemlock boughs upon which we slept, and our condition was not a very pleasant one. We were rather scant for fuel while there, uh, but the depot master kindly gave us permission to pick up wood around the depot, and one of my cousins, Daniel Johnson, although I did not know it at the time, who was at work upon a bridge nearby, gave us permission to pick up the chips that were left by their kindness as we got along then very comfortably. While I was here, I had some circulars printed for my wife and thrown around the village as she commenced to practice medicine and with it of selling baskets, which we did very well. We had to go for a mile for our ash toward Kennebunk, which we had permission to get by cutting up the tops for the owners. The butts of these ash trees we carried to our camp upon our shoulders, but after being there a short time, the depot master gave us permission to take a small car up to the place where we loaded it up, and as it was a downgrade back, we took home quite a load. We had this car also to get our firewood, and we felt extremely grateful to the master for his kindness. We took quite a sum of money, my wife uh, having as much practice as she wished to attend. One morning when my grocery man came to bring us some things, I was somewhat surprised by his saying that my father was coming up to see me. One day my wife was in the grocery store where we traded, and while there I passed along upon the street and looked in at the door, and seeing my wife, I passed on. Mr. Simon Goodwin, who was in the store, remarked to Daniel Hunson, my cousin, who was there, that I looked just like the Johnsons, and that he had no doubt but that I was Mr. Johnson's lost son. This interested somewhat my cousin, and he took the first opportunity to see my brother Samuel and inform him of the circumstance. There was another incident that attracted some interest. It was the remark of a little boy who lived in Seiko near Mr. Bowden's, a man that married my sister. He had been up to our camp, and when he went home, he told his mother that there was an Indian over to the Biddeford Depot that looked just like Mrs. Bowden. The mother told the child not to repeat it, for if Mrs. Bowden should hear what he had said, they would be put out. My brother Samuel, after hearing what Goodwin said, came up to our camp and began to talk about medicine with me. I noticed that he scrutinized me somewhat closely, which I thought was very impertinent. After looking at me for some time, he asked me how I came by that scar on my forehead. I told him that a horse had kicked me. This was what the Indians had told me years before, and I always supposed that it was true. He then asked to take off my cap if I would, which I did, asking him rather bluntly if there was anything more that he wished. After taking or talking with him some time longer, he went away, feeling pretty confident that I was his brother. To the telegraph office in Seiko he went and sent a dispatch to my father, who was then living in Lewiston, Maine. He wished to keep the whole affair secret, 
but there was another person in the telegraph office at the same time. And besides the operator, who hearing the news, went out and told it to another, and in this way it spread through the two, it spread through the two places, and by night it was pretty well circulated. The next morning, a crowd began to collect at the depot, which provoked us exceedingly, and they could not have been more interested in seeing me as had I been a grizzly bear. They also talked very extravagantly what they would do if they were in my father's place. One would hang up every redskin in the state of Maine. Another would shoot every one of the number at the depot there, whilst a third would tar and feather the company that I was with and ride them out on a rail. In this manner they railed at us all day, telling us what they would do, which made me and us extremely angry and lowered the whites much in our estimation. The morning of the day that my father came, my brother George, whom I had not known, came up to the depot. Two young men were standing upon the platform. As he came up, one of them spoke to me and said, Here's a brother of yours, John. Well, I said, I look as well as he does, I guess. Of course you look as well as I do, my brother would. After looking at me a short time and conversing some, my brother went away. My father did not arrive until afternoon, and when he came, there had been quite a number of Indians who joined our company. And when he arrived, I was in a tent with Dr. Newell, and he entered the tent with two of my brothers and one of my sisters, and this was the first time my father had seen me for 22 years. You cannot well imagine his feelings. In imagination, his mind went back over to my past life, the day that I was lost, the little accident by which I received a scar upon my forehead, and all these rushed through his mind. But subduing as much as possible his feelings he addressed Dr. Newell, whilst I sat upon the ground upon one side of the tent. My father, 22 years, my father told the doctor that he wished to speak with me, and that if I was his son, I had been gone some 22 years. He can't be your son, said Dr. Newell. The expression of the face, the features, the color of his ears, of his eyes and his hair, and his size certainly give us every reason to believe that he is my son. And thus my father spoke. My father then asked how old I was, saying that if I was his child, I ought to be about 25. I looked somewhat young for my age, and the doctor replied, that I certainly could not be his son, as I was only 18 years old. I went out then and left the doctor and my father talking together. Outside, the crowd had increased, and I heard imprecations from every quarter hurled against the Indians, which made me feel somewhat cross and ugly, and going into the tent again, I told my father that there was not enough whites in the two places to take me away from the Indians. My father replied that he did not wish to take me away, but that if I was his son, I was of age and my own master, and that all I wished to do was to satisfy himself whether I was with whether I was his child or not. My father then, then asked me if I would take off my hat, which I did, and he examined the scar upon my forehead and asked me how it came by it, that, that it was there. 
I made him the same answer that I did my brother, Samuel. My father had quite a conversation with me as a result, asking me various questions, and just before they left, my sister took out a miniature of another sister of mine and asked me if I did not look like that. Feeling rather cross, I told her that the miniature looked no more like me than the harp of Solomon and, 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 and did like a dragon. I told them that I did not think that they had done right in making such an excitement and getting so many people up to our camp and that if they wished to see me, they might have asked me to their house. I asked them if their carpets were too good for me to walk on or their houses too good for me to go in. And I told them that they had spoiled our business for we had not sold any baskets and could not get a chance to make any, neither to cook nor to eat, no, for there was a crowd around us all the time. My brother Samuel said that he was willing to pay for us all the damage that he had done, but I would not take anything, feeling too proud to accept money for no benefit given for it. My father then left and asked me to come and see him at his son's house in the village. I felt on angry and told him that his invitation came too late. My father said that if I would not come and see him, that he would come and see me, and then they left the camp. The mood in which my father left me was no pleasant one. Surrounded as I had been throughout the day by a crowd of people who were foolish enough to boast that what they would do if circumstances were thus and so. Uh, and so I thought that myself and the rest of the company had been insulted by these whites. But after all, I had different feelings toward my father. He had not assumed that bravado spirit, had not threatened us with punishment, nor hurled imprecations upon our heads, but in somewhat a different manner had expressed his views and opinions in a calm, although in a feeling manner, and I felt somehow or other kindlier feelings toward him than any person I, I had met before with. But I had not much opinion of the whites. I had always been taught not to trust them, and having lived with the Indians until I had formed their habits and customs and their dispositions and living with them.